Thank you, James, uh, and welcome everyone to the second APAC FINOS meetup. Um, delighted to have you with us today and uh, really appreciate you, you joining us uh, for this uh, event and, and community building uh, activity for, for FINOS. Um, I'm gonna do uh, some introductions. I'm gonna run through the agenda for the call today. And uh, my role really is as, uh, as MC for the, uh, for the call. Um, I'll introduce myself and then hand over to, uh, to, to my colleagues uh, who have uh, kindly agreed to, uh, to speak with us today. Um, so just a bit about me. My name is Andrew King. Um, I am uh, an individual supporter of FINOS. So I have uh, volunteered to, uh, to help build the community here in APAC. I'm based in Australia, um, but I've had various roles um, globally with financial technology firms throughout my career. Uh, started off uh, in my career in, in financial services in Toronto. I've also worked in, in London and, and now here in Australia. Um, I, my background, the, the majority of my time was with a company called IHS Market. Uh, I've also worked um, for uh, Symphony, uh, who are participating on this call. And, and currently, I am working to help a number of different financial technology firms with their business development strategy uh, here in Australia. So firms like Duco and Dua, uh, Cosaic. Uh, where I sent the invitations from, uh, as well as I push pull. Uh, so quite a, a varied um, exposure to the financial technology landscape, um, and uh, you know, really uh, excited to see how we can grow not only those businesses uh, throughout the APAC region, um, but also help. Uh, the, the conversation around uh, open source and, uh, and, and FINOS is obviously a very important um, vehicle for that conversation. Uh, it's the purpose of the call today. Uh, and obviously we're here today to, uh, to introduce you to the FINOS organization and, and the purpose of the organization, um, but also to two of the, the major um, uh, proponents and, and uh, and, and uh, participants in the FINOS uh, group, uh, which are Symphony and Genesis. Um, so without much further ado, I'm gonna let you know the agenda for the, the call today um, and, and who's gonna be speaking uh, through over the next uh, 45 to 50 minutes or so. Um, so first up, we have uh, James McLeod. Uh, James uh, is the Director of Community at FINOS, he's waving. Uh, and he is based in London. Uh, so he's gonna give an introduction to FINOS, um, its, its purpose and, uh, and, and some background. Um, James is then gonna hand over to Yong Sheng Tan, who is a Singapore-based uh, former colleague of mine uh, and who is the technical lead for Symphony's developer relations in APEC. Uh, our third speaker is Jose Pozo. Uh, Jose is the VP of Core Development at Genesis. Uh, like James, he's also based in the UK, uh, and he is going to give a talk about uh, the Genesis low-code application platform. Um, so a few little uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we will have time for some Q&A. Uh, we'd ask you to hold your questions to the end. Uh, or if you want to submit them through the Q&A box, that's also great, and, and we'll read those out at, at the end. Um, the call and the session is being recorded. Uh, we will make the, the recording uh, available, but definitely be aware that that, that, is, uh, that is taking place. Um, and without much more from me, uh, I'm going to hand over to James uh, from, from FINOS. So, James, welcome. Hi, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening um, with everybody within the APAC region. Um, I'm James McLeod, uh, FINOS um, Director of Community, um, and I'm your host for today. So I'm the person who's um, looking at all of the various different Q&A questions, et cetera, on the, the end of um, uh, the webinar. And so if you've got any questions, they're gonna come in to me and then I'll relay them to, to Andrew and the team. 
Um, and I'm here today to um, uh, talk to you about Finos, uh, what Finos is and what we do and how you can get involved. So um, for those who are new to Finos, um, Finos is an independent nonprofit membership organization whose purpose is to accelerate collaboration and innovation in financial services. Um, and Finos is actually um, a project within the Linux Foundation. Um, and so if um, you are aware of um, projects like Kubernetes or if you uh, use um, Node.js, um, you're probably aware of um, the, Linux, the Linux Foundation and all of our um, sibling um, projects within the Linux Foundation. Um, and Finos is the vertical within the Linux Foundation that looks after financial services. And so we provide uh, a mechanism for keeping um, projects and collaborators and our members safe um, within that regulated environment. Um, and we are a nonprofit, which means that um, we are here to serve our um, community. Um, and we're also here to serve our members as well. And so, you know, as part of the Linux Foundation, we are here for um, firms and also participants within the wider open source community. Our members are actually vast um, and diverse as well. And as you can see on this slide, um, we have a lot of banks, um, technology companies and engineering companies as well as part of um, the um, Finos um, community. Um, our membership ranges from big banks um, that you will have heard of, um, so such as Citi, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, all the way through to HSBC, Capital One, um, UBS and Morgan Stanley, to name just a few, um, through to a lot of technology companies that you will have heard of as well. And so um, because we're an open source um, foundation, GitHub um, are members of the foundation, if you're aware of GitHub and you know the community that forms around open source. But equally, we also have um, GitLab as well. Um, plus, we have um, associate members like AIR and um, Interwork Alliance, is the um, in the source commons have recently just joined as associate members um, and at Open UK as well, uh, alongside um, consultancies such as Accenture. And as you can see, and also um, the, the members that we have on the call, not to forget Symphony and Genesis too, um, which we're very pleased to introduce to you today. Um, and so, as you can see, we have a real diverse um, set of engineering talent within our community. And we bring all of this together in order to bring some really interesting and diverse projects um, and events um, as part of the foundation. Now, the reason that I'm here today is to um, talk to you about why um, Finos exists um, and uh, how open source in finance uh, enables the industry. Um, and so people on the call will be, where, be aware of um, CICD and DevOps and cloud um, and also development and how all of the various different open source tools that actually exist within the industry come together um, in order to allow us to accelerate our engineering at pace. Um, now, as you can see on this slide, there's a vast amount of tools that are available to engineers and organizations to use. Um, and the acceleration of digital transformation within uh, financial services wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for these open source tools that um, teams can actually leverage. Uh, now, within financial services, as you're probably aware, um, a lot of the bigger banks used to be um, very kind of industrial in the way that um, projects and um, technology um, teams were run. Um, they would hand their deliverables through a very industrial revolution way of developing, um, which is now changing um, into something which is a lot more um, agile and lean and feature team oriented. oriented. Um, and so this slide um, describes how those industrial teams or central teams, the delivery um, uh, tickets would go through in order to get um, done, um, have now come together into more lean individual feature teams that deliver um, features faster by bringing the teams together, um, including open source, uh, which is a great, you know, continuous um, agile way of working. However, what we've um, found within industry is that um, 
across all of the various different financial players, so the big banks, a lot of the um, digital transformation is still happening within those lean teams. And so although um, the individual feature teams are delivering fast for their individual projects that they're delivering, there's still room for improvement. And so there's still ways and means in which we can um, create even more efficiency by taking all of these siloed teams that are delivering fast individually um, and bringing them together you know, across the globe. And so not only do we um, improve digital transformation on the ground, but we can actually continue to improve digital transformation across all of the different financial services companies and fintech companies that are also working in this way. And so therefore we actually create a, a faster industry of more joined up teams and more joined up collaboration. Um, so FinOS is actually the um, mechanism in which we do that. Um, FinOS um, is an open source community um, that brings all of these various different teams together um, and unites everybody within uh, financial services across the open source landscape. Um, and as you can see here, we unite everybody through um, GitHub and we bring everybody together across the globe, including the APAC region and also um, within Europe and also across the US as well, in order to collaborate through both um, open source delivery through code, um, events and meetups such as this one, um, and various other events and blogs, etc., cetera, um, as you would expect of a foundation that likes to um, bring the financial services together um, in a safe and trusted um, mechanism. Uh, and so with that, within um, FINOS, we have various different projects um, that cross the, the industry and the landscape, um, such as um, Legend, which is actually being contributed by Goldman Sachs, um, Perspective, which is being um, contributed by JP Morgan. Um, we also have Cloud Service Certification, which is you know, joining together of cloud services through Infrastructure as Code and BDD testing. Um, that brings, you know, uh, certified cloud policies together with those um, various um, different um, uh, infrastructure as code scripts. Um, and we also have standards projects as well, such as FDC3, um, which was contributed um, to the foundation. Now, all of these different projects, so these are just um, a subset of the projects that we have, um, but the actual teams that are inside um, the, the projects are uh, teams from the financial service, services industry. And so if you um, visit the FINOS organization on GitHub and look within these projects, you will notice um, banking engineers um, collaborating and contributing equally amongst the open source community. And you can also leverage these projects for your own use under an Apache 2 license as well. Uh, so to give you kind of like a, um, an overview of the types of um, uh, projects that we have. So perspective, as um, I mentioned before, and also Waltz um, fall under data visualization. Um, we also have data modeling projects um, such as Legend, as mentioned before, but also Morgan Stanley's um, Morpha. Um, under cloud, we have um, cloud service certification, but we also have a special interest group called um, DevOps Mutualization um, that kind of spans into cloud. And so, you know, the um, borders between those projects and the special interest groups are blurred and you tend to find um, the same um, contributors come into um, those two initiatives as well. Then we also have interoperability, um, such as FDC3, which is the standard that I mentioned before that describes um, financial objects and how you can actually share those across the financial desktop. But we also have Plexus as well, which is um, uh, a Deutsche Bank contribution into the foundation. Um, and both um, Plexus and also Waltz have been contributed and are contributed into by Deutsche Bank um, engineers. We also have um, data related um, projects too. So it's not just um, libraries and software that you can download you know, and clone and contribute into, but we also have um, projects that are related to data and data modeling. Um, so both um, Data Hub and Data Helix 
um, exist in order to simulate data and provide um, a test environment for you to synthesize data for your development teams. Um, so they are data synthesis um, projects. Um, and Legend exists in order to model um, financial objects, um, both using the uh, Legend um, infrastructure, um, plus also as Legend working groups that come together to describe um, how those various different models you know, should exist and how they should be described um, within the Legend data modeling platform itself. So the Finos community uh, welcomes everybody to join, um, no matter you know, the region uh, where you are. So we very much welcome contribution um, from the APAC region as well. And so the question to ask is, are you ready to join the Finos open source community? Um, and so if you are, and you would like to get involved, um, it's very uh, straightforward and easy. So we ask people um, to come to um, the Finos organization on GitHub or Finos.org to evaluate our materials um, and also evaluate, you know, software and code um, and anything else that we have to, to offer and then consume, you know, those and test them and use them and utilize them. Um, also participating in our events, such as the event that we're at today, um, is a great way to get involved. And then ultimately, um, in your own time and at your own pace, you can start contributing into the, into the project as well. And then ultimately, um, Finos likes to uh, enable people's careers. Um, so if you would like to lead a Finos project, you can do that as well. So my voice has gone a bit husky, give me a second. Thank you very much. And so with that, um, I'd like to hand back to Andrew, who I believe is going to introduce our next um, presenter. Thanks, James. Sound like, sounds like we were just about to run out of your, your voice there, so, so just in time. Um, that, that's right. Now, I really appreciate the, uh, the introduction and, and overview of FINOS. I, I hope that gives everyone a good sense of uh, the objectives of the, uh, of the uh, community and what we're going to do now and, and what I'd like to do is, is thank our two presenters that are coming up who have uh, very much volunteered to be uh, front and center on this meetup and, and present uh, ways that their firms are participating in the, in the open source environment. Um, first speaker is Yongsheng Tan um, from Symphony. So Yongsheng, I'm going to hand over straight to you and um, give you the floor. Thank you, Andrew. If you could stop sharing your screen. Okay, thank you. Is my screen up? Yeah, perfect. All right, so uh, thank you, James and Andrew for the introduction and uh, thank you, Finos, for having me today. So. Uh, my name is Yongsheng, and I am the technical lead for the developer relations team here at Symphony. And uh, today, we're, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our bot developer kit, as well as its uh, migration into the Finos ecosystem. So today's agenda will be fairly high level. I'll talk a little bit about myself, followed by Symphony, if you're not too familiar with us. We'll talk about bots and why they matter how to start building them with the BDK or Bot Developer Kit 2.0, our move with bringing BDK into Finos, and how you can get started with BDK, followed by a really short demo on the actual mechanics of uh, bringing up a bot. And we'll have Q&A right at the end of this session. So feel free to write your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to them at the end. So a little bit about me. I am born and raised and still based in Singapore. I've spent uh, most of my career in finance, in banking where I started, and then in asset management before uh, landing in Symphony. So I've been through a couple of roles from operations to market risk, to uh, sales and trading analytics, and then through equities, collaboration, technology, and that's how I ended up at Symphony. So I've, I've been through working on backend, front end projects, so pretty much full stack, and then on uh, the data front as well, and uh, infrastructure is something of an interest for me. So within Symphony, what 
I do with developer relations is most of my time is spent on advocacy. So events like these, as well as reaching out to the developer community, we do learning. So uh, the content for our structured certification program that you'll hear me talk about later, we do events. So like hackathons, meetups, so on and so forth. I also do a bit of maintenance on the documentation that our developers read, as well as some internal automation projects that keep our team running. Uh, I also have great passion for coffee, photography, running, keyboard. So hit me up if you want to know about those. Or you can email me at young.tan at symphony.com or LinkedIn through there. So if you don't already know about Symphony, I'll give you a very brief introduction. So Symphony is uh, the leading secure, scalable collaboration platform for financial services. So we pride ourselves in our top in class data security and compliance capabilities. This enables uh, cross-company collaboration, and we are the largest trusted community as a result of uh, all these capabilities. And so our open architecture enables our customers and partners to build things like automations and integrations. And these are not for fun. So the idea is that people can use these to build solutions that address industry and market challenges. So end of the day, you have fit for purpose workflows that work across the industry. And that's what Symphony is. So how do you get started actually building these automations? Uh, we start with the concept of bots. And we see bots as the connective tissue within your organization. What that means is you have your own internal uh, systems and data resources, and these are on the left here. So you could have a database, an NLP engine, the research distribution and whatnot, and all these little disparate systems within your organizations exist uh, as they are today. And you could have a bot orchestrate workflows that make use of these data resources or perform an action and so on and so forth. And you can use uh, Symfony APIs that are open to do things like manage rooms, send messages, uh, look up the Symfony directory, and have all of these orchestrated by this single bot that will serve a certain function. So we see this as incredibly powerful and the way that workflows should be, bring, should be brought forward. And so how do you get started building bots? Uh, this comes to our bot developer kit. And the BDK 2.0, as we call it, is an evolution of uh, previous SDKs that were traditionally focused on our REST API bindings. So one REST call is bound to a line of code, for example. And uh, there was a previous version of the bot developer kit, the 1.0. We built that in an opinionated stack, but I think some people weren't very on board with uh, parts of that architecture. So what we've done through events and feedback is we've rebuilt this from scratch, collaboratively built with our community on the key principles of simplicity as well as modularity. So with that, it, we built an ecosystem of modules basically. So it's not just one uh, project, it's a bunch of different projects split across three layers. There's the core layer, the advanced layer, and the integration layer. And within these three layers, there are different modules that fit into the picture, all of them built upon the foundation of our same uh, open API stack. So things like configuration, authentication, and uh, the actual API calls, we don't want you to do that manually. We have the bot developer kit do that for you. And on top of that, there are further abstractions. So if you're binding like a command handler, how do you, how do you handle a composition view? So we have the activities API to abstract that for you so you don't have to write that from scratch. And then the integration layer basically binds uh, frameworks like Spring Boot so that Spring Boot developers feel like they're developing using a, a native language and it feels uh, very uh, normal for them to, to develop in the, the BDK 2.0. So all these different modules are maintained by Symfony. Uh, they are well documented, they are well supported and they continue to have uh, feature requests and so on and so forth. But the idea of this new ecosystem is such that there will be modules that can coexist that are outside of the remit of Symfony. And we see these modules as being built by community efforts. And why this is important is because there are some aspects of workflows that are not, uh, Symfony won't be privy to. So if you're building a very specific uh, technical integration with a product, or if you have a specific business use case that you'd like to do, uh, that will be something that you can maintain. And these will be modules that can be loaded along with the bot developer kit 2.0, and they will coexist uh, very nicely. And so this brings us to the move to Finos. So uh, the, the BDK 2.0 for Java was uh, officially moved in the middle of last month. And although this is just a simple move of a repository, this is the culmination of months of work between 
uh, the symphony engineering team as well as Finos in terms of working out the different aspects of how a project should be incubated within Finos, the legality, the processes, uh, the best practices of maintenance and so on and so forth. So we, we, were, we were quite happy to move all this over. So Finos, uh, as James has mentioned earlier, has a very large ecosystem, a very, very large group of different banks and financial institutions. So we, we feel like this is a good place for us to put something like this where our interests align in terms of expanding the ecosystem, uh, building out uh, community projects where it makes sense and having them be reused across the financial services industry. So our vision remains the same. It should be an ecosystem of these projects and you could have specific modules that address certain domains. Uh, it could be trading, it could be settlement, it could be uh, any, any sort of business workflow. It could be technical integrations with NLP engines and so on. It could be product integrations if you are a product company or vendor. And so this is just the start of Symphony's involvement. We also have more projects in the pipeline. So currently it's the BDK 2.0 for Java. There is also the Python that is in beta now, as well as a .NET version that will come at the end of the year. These will also be contributed to Finos, uh, as well as uh, other more advanced uh, tools like our UI toolkit for building extension apps. So these are UI-based uh, applications instead of bots. So uh, how do you get started with BDK 2.0? So uh, at Symphony, what we have done is create a completely uh, structured learning program at learn.symphony.com. This is where you will get free training and certification. So you'll go through a self-paced and uh, self-led program where you will watch uh, videos that will describe concepts as well as uh, uh, live demos for how to get started coding bots and, and a certification exam to prove that you, know, you have understood all that. Uh, as part of this program, you also get free access to a developer sandbox. So I'll show that in a bit. And all that you need basically to get started with your bots is have our bot generator, which creates projects for you. And uh, you can get started running this simple command called Yo Symphony 2.0. So at the end of the day, all you need is an idea, uh, the training from our certification center, and you have your bot. So let's get started with a demo. So uh, as I said, all you need is a very simple uh, command. So what I'm going to first do is uh, create a project uh, with that command. So I'll just type yo symphony 2.0. This is going to uh, give me a number of questions to answer. So uh, I will have my uh, sandbox. So this is something that you'll get free of charge if uh, you enter our certification program. I will have uh, credentials that are part of that program as well. I will be creating a bot today in Java with no framework using Maven and I'll just leave the rest as defaults. So it's gonna hit to create an RSA key pair and do an initial compile and we are done. So uh, we can now open that project in our favorite IDE. So I'll give you a very quick run through of what that looks like. So uh, when the project is imported into your IDE, you have a complete project scaffold uh, running already. And this includes things like uh, a defined configuration file. So that's the same. Uh, details we entered earlier. Uh, and this includes the uh, RSA key pair. So what you'll do is take the public key and give it to your pod administrator. Uh, in the interest of time, I've already uploaded one earlier. So I'll be getting rid of the generated one and putting mine in. And if you open the main class, you'll see that uh, it's a very simple class that just has a bunch of different uh, command handlers already defined. So basically, we can just go ahead and run the project. And what that will do is it will launch the application. It will start doing the authentication process. Uh, it will start uh, creating a data feed, which is how events are handled in Symfony. And basically your bot is up in a matter of seconds. And so now that your bot is running, let's go have a look at what that looks like. So this is the developer sandbox called develop2. And so we'll look for our bot here. Uh, I named it Finos Meetup Bot. And so my bot is there. So in my code, I have a very simple GIF command handler. Just so I, all I need to do is go here and type slash GIF and see if the bot responds. And there you go. So there you have it. In a matter of seconds, I have a complete project generated, a bot running, and the bot basically responds to <clears throat> commands that I send. And so you can do things like have text messages, structured forms, and so on. I'm not gonna dive too deep into how to actually build up the rest of these things. But basically with the BDK 
the full arsenal of Symphony's open APIs are at your disposal. And you can learn all of those things at uh, our learning uh, website as well as get your free certification. So uh, yeah, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you for your time. And I think the questions will get to them later. So feel free to reach out to me at this email address or my team at developer.relations at symphony.com. And I'll hand over to our next speaker, who is Jose. Thank you. Thanks, Yong Sheng. Uh, that was great. Really, really informative and um, very impressive. So uh, appreciate that. You're right. We've, we've got some questions, but we'll save those to the end if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, as you said, uh, next is Jose Pozo. Jose, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's a, an early morning for you in London. Um, looking forward to hearing more about Genesis. I, I know you guys don't have a presence in APAC uh, yet, but um, that may change in the, in the near future. And uh, also congratulate you on your uh, very recent uh, funding round. And, and maybe you could say a few words about that. That's, uh, that's very exciting news for the, uh, for the future of your, your company. Um, Jose, I'll, I'll hand over to you and um, you've got the floor. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you so much about, um, you know, the congratulations. The, uh, we worked really hard to get the Series B funding. It was uh, amazing for us. I've been with Genesis since the beginning. So pretty much since the first line of code was written. And honestly, it's, it's been a journey. So yeah, I'm really happy to be here and talk about it. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Yeah, can see it perfectly. Okay, perfect. Right, so uh, thanks, Yuan Sheng, for your presentation. That was really, really interesting. We, we in Genesis, we partnered with Symfony not so long ago. I think it was November. And we have already started building bots. And we do all sorts of, sorts of really interesting things, actually. We, we can control all of our cloud instances from Symfony by using commands uh, and our integration with the Genesis Environment Manager. And honestly, it's, it's a great thing. I mean, our sales guys can bring up demo instances, can stop them, can start them whenever they want. Um, a very, very useful tool. So yeah, looking forward to more integration with Symfony. Uh, now, my name is Jose Bozo, and I'm going to talk about how do we use open source technology in Genesis? And why do we think it's, it's a great thing for a low code application platform, but really any application? So um, I'll start by talking a bit about myself. Um, I have about 10 plus years experience in developing high performance and distributed applications. But really my focus on uh, financial services uh, started about eight years ago. Um, I joined a company called Mysis, uh, which is now called Finastra, I believe. And I started working on a domain specific language based in Groovy which would generate uh, C code, which runs on GPUs. And, and this was very, very useful because it allowed business analysts to code risk scenarios using Monte Carlo simulations that would run uh, hundreds of times quicker than uh, just a CPU simulation. Um, my interest for high performance and basically enabling other users translated into what Genesis is today. Right? We want to have something that enables uh, people without lots of knowledge to create their own applications and they are high performance, robust and reliable. Um, so the agenda for today uh, is for items, uh, starting with the Genesis vision and history, the challenges of using open source, not everything is, is a, an easy path every time, the lessons learned and some examples. So, Starting with the Genesis vision and history, we wanted to be the, the leading local application platform provider in the capital markets. Um, and we thought it was a great moment to do this. The reasons for it is the microservices started to being something bit commonplace across the industry, but not so much within the financial services industry. So it was a great opportunity to bring them in. Um, open source was also not something very common in the financial services industry either. Uh, it was a lot more about um, proprietary solutions that are certified and audited and all these different things. 
rather than just relying on open source technology. Uh, cloud services, same story. Most of uh, banks and investment banks, they would have their own uh, internal cloud or they would have their own on-premise service, but they were not relying on cloud services so much. So everything seemed like a great opportunity to jump in uh, with a new platform that takes advantages of all these new trends in technology and really great um, really great, great technologies that financial industry is, is not using yet. So we started focusing on technology R&D first. We wanted to have a great foundation for our framework before we actually go to market and start selling to clients. And we spent several years working on it. Um, I could explain all this, but my colleague Ray uh, created a great, great video that now James is going to display for you. Where it will be a lot more clearer than if I tried to. So um, James, would you please uh, share with us? I'll stop sharing my screen now. My name is Ray Chi, and I'm head of solutions delivery at Genesis Global. So what is an LCAP? LCAP stands for Low-Code Application Platform. Low-code is pretty self-explanatory. You can build and deliver solutions exactly as you need them with much less coding effort. Less code means faster delivery of enterprise-ready systems at lower cost. The application platform is the comprehensive set of services and components that provide a lot of the capabilities that you need for a system straight out of the box, which greatly accelerates solution delivery. They're enterprise ready and proven. So what is the Genesis LCAP and why is it different? There are a number of LCAPs available, but not all LCAPs are the same. They may all have a number of common attributes or capabilities, however, be quite distinct in their intricacies of microservices, business components, and tools. The Genesis LCAP is the financial markets native LCAP that is built bottom up specifically to service the requirements and challenges of financial markets. Most LCAPs offer some tools to support the development process that is required. After all, there is still some coding effort. So having optimized dev tools accelerates the development process. They offer a selection of reusable functional components that perform actions that support the business process that you're trying to implement. You get non-functional components for all fundamental system requirements like security, scalability, resilience, robustness, failover, all systems need these capabilities, but with LCAP, they come straight out of the box. And then you have a whole range of tools to support the entire life cycle, from requirements and planning, the integrated development environment, managing the code, managing the builds, managing the deployments, managing the environments, all the way through to operating the production system and managing and evolving the system going forward. Taken together, all of those capabilities comprise a low-code application platform. The genesis difference is, unlike most LCAPs, which have evolved from generic business process and workflow tools, genesis has been specifically designed for creating and solving complex, high-performance financial services solutions. The entire platform has been designed and architected with financial services in mind, so it is capable of delivering the simple business process management workflows through to the high complex, low latency, high throughput requirements of real-time data distribution in risk and trading. Right, so that was a good summary about what an LCAP is. Um, but obviously, being head of core development at Genesis means I focus on the server-side platform development. And I'd like to share with you a video of how you can define data schemas and you can quickly bring up an application displaying real-time data on grids. So I have another short video for it. Um, James, will you please show it? Thank you. My name is Jose and I am the head of core development at Genesis. Let me show you how quickly we can create a Genesis data server component which is able to provide real-time information to a simple trade plotter. First of all, we need to define some relevant fields for the trade table, like ID, quantity, symbol, and price. 
As you can see, the GPAL definition helps me by providing suggestions and auto-completions. And moreover, it's able to find mistakes automatically. As an example, I will not be able to assign a text value to a numeric field. Additionally, I can access the full documentation of this GPAL definition and see sample configuration so I can quickly learn on the go. Now that the trait fields are defined, it is time to create the trait table. We are now using the GPAL definition for tables, and the user experience changes accordingly. As you can see, the GPAL system is telling me that I need to define a primary key to define a table, so I will go ahead and do that. Each trait entity will be identified by its ID field, so this is the ideal candidate for the primary key. But now I have another error showing me that the ID field is not part of this table definition, so let us add it as well. Notice how all the fields I defined previously are available in this code, so I can reference them, reference them quickly. It is important to remark that these fields could be defined in separate components and automatically imported without having to declare them first. So now we have a trait table defined in our system and we need to expose a real-time feed of information to the front end. In order to do this, I need to create the Genesis Data Server GPAL definition. As this is a server component definition, I can now reference the table I have just created in the previous step. And that's it. This basic definition is enough to provide trade entities from our backend to our graphical interface. However, query definitions are rich in functionality and have many customization options. As an example, I will add a filter on this query so we will only show trades with high enough notional values. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I hope um, that explained a little bit uh, how we do things in Genesis, what is a bit of a low code application platform, uh, easy ways to define data schemas, easy ways to define uh, data grids you can see in real time, um, et cetera. Uh, but how do we achieve all this? So that's what we're going to talk about now. Let me share my screen again. Yep, there you go. Right. So, open source technology challenges. There's a bit of history here, um, but first of all, the challenges really. So there are so many open source technologies available and so many databases, network libraries, uh, it's just so much, right? There's a huge and amazing ecosystem. Um, it's very, very difficult to choose which technology suits your project best. So when you start from scratch and you want to create a new application, you might choose a database layer thinking that one is the best and the most suitable for the project, but then over time, um, requirements might change. And therefore your database is not so suitable anymore. You need to change it. So you've technically chosen the wrong technology for the use case, but you couldn't know ahead of time. Now you need to spend quite a lot of time changing it and that's not great. Um, obviously better technology also comes after time. Um, and therefore, you would like to upgrade, but sometimes it's not so easy. Your technology is too coupled to that library or database, and the investment is too high. So how can you move forward, make sure you can take advantage of open source without spending too much money on it and without making sure you're too tightly coupled to a certain solution? Well. This is a lesson we learn over time, um, starting with our Genesis database layer. We started using some uh, database layer called Foundation DB. It was a great, great, amazing uh, technology. Um, it was built to be some sort of replacement of Google Spanner, which powers the Google search engine. So incredibly scalable and fast. Unfortunately, it was proprietary technology. Unfortunately, and unfortunately in a way, we'll get there. Uh, but basically what happened is it was acquired by Apple. Um, Apple saw the opportunity to buy great technology at a very good price. Um, and they decided to use it to power the whole global iCloud infrastructure. Now, the Genesis framework and platform at the time was built around FoundationDB. And this presented a, a big issue, right? We, we cannot use the technology anymore, it has been bought out. So, Fortunately, Apple released it as an open source database layer a few years later, although it was too late for us, but it didn't matter. And it didn't matter because at this point we realized we cannot rely on proprietary technology anymore. 
or not solely solely on it, right? Our approach to open source changed completely. And what did we decide to do? Well, proprietary technologies pose high risk. We learned our lesson very early in our journey, and that's a good thing. It means we need to provide an abstraction layer for each core part of the system, whether it's a database layer or a, a pops up mechanism, whatever it is, we need to have an abstraction layer. We cannot just rely directly on a third party technology, especially if it's proprietary. So, Starting with the database abstraction layer, uh, we decided to harness the power and efficiency of particular database layers like uh, Aerospike, um, amazing database layer, uh, very high performance, foundation DB, same, different uh, use cases, but amazing NoSQL database layer, Postgres, you know, 30 years plus history of being the greatest open source relational database, et cetera. We can use all those within the database, Genesis database abstraction layer. Now, it is not just the only place we use database abstraction. Uh, sorry, we use open source. Uh, there are three different areas where we use open source very, very uh, strongly. One of them is event processing. The second one is event and notification message bus. And the third one is the database layer as already discussed. In terms of event processing, we chose reactive extensions. This is an amazing abstraction uh, around low level threading, synchronization, threat safety. It basically allows you to process events uh, without having to care about all those sorts of things. And not just in one language, but many, many different languages. So the same concepts you learn for RxJS in JavaScript, you can apply to RxJava in, in Java world, or you can apply it to .NET in Rx. Um, this is great for us as a, as a developer and also as a platform uh, provider, because if you need to use um, anything in your front implementation related to event processing, you are probably going to be familiar with it because it's a commonplace tool. It's available in many, many different products. Um, and it's also used in many different types of solutions. So not just database APIs, but also front end platforms like Angular or libraries. <clears throat> Our event and notification message bus was also abstracted so we can use different open source solutions with it. So ZeroMQ was our initial messaging bus. Um, we, we find like it's a great solution for pops up mechanism. It has some downsides though with, within cloud infrastructure as multicast, um, multicast messages are not available in our cloud providers. Therefore, we easily swap for Aaron. And Aaron is built for performance, highest throughput and most predictable messaging with, with using simple binary encoding, also aligned with FIX. So FIX has standards with uh, simple binary encoding as well. So really, really a great fit for our financial services platform. Uh, and again, we could only do this because we rely on open source solutions and we rely on making sure that we can move forward um, and use any technology we can uh, with our abstraction layers. We can also use proprietary solutions like Solus, um, but that's not really relevant for this um, chat. Uh, then database layer, non-time series. So we use other technologies from time series, but as I mentioned before, foundation to be horizontally scalable, multi-record asset guarantees, focus on reliable and consistency. Um, so CP mode and error spike. Similarly, focus on performance and availability rather than um, multi-record asset guarantees. Postgres, again, who doesn't know Postgres? Amazing database. Now, the great thing about having these three databases on our side is that the same solution, the same product using the platform can be used using these three different databases without changing the code base. You just need to switch the database settings, right? So if you want to create a high performance reconciliation a tool that is able to process millions and millions of records per second, you probably choose Aerospike. Uh, but if you want to have just a few thousand records a day and then an easier way of querying this data using a relational database, you would use Postgres. And that's fine. Whatever you need, you can choose and you, you can pick and choose. And that's a, a great thing to make sure every single solution fits our clients. Now, the importance of the Finnish community is that leveraging open source is 
really the way to go. Not just because um, it's ready available and it's everybody can fix it and everybody can use it. It's just because everybody can contribute to make a, a better future and to accelerate development. We, we don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. We want to make sure we use the best tools at hand. Now, we contribute to a variety of cross-industry open source initiatives. So we've, we've done a pull requests for Aerospike um, issues with founding clients, so also for something like QuickFix. So it's a, it's an open source fix uh, in gateway implementation. So we, we do contribute and we also contribute to fitness initiatives. So we have in, uh, integration with FTC3 and financial objects, all those different things. Um, now, that's all I had to say. Um, thanks, they say, well. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the Q&A final. Yeah. Thank you. That's great, Jose, thank you so much. Um, Really, really appreciate that. It was incredibly insightful into the uh, into the Genesis platform. Um, just want to before we launch into Q and A, uh, once again thank all of our speakers, uh, James, Jose, and Yong Cheng. Uh, really appreciate you bringing Finos and and your experiences with Finos to the uh, APAC community. Uh, it's a growing community and. Um, you know, we, we hope to see an events like this uh, help help that uh, community flourish. So, um, we'll look uh, we'll look to the next one, uh, and and we'll let you know when that is uh, when that is coming. Now, we do definitely have some questions. Uh, first one is from uh, Ethan from Kosaic uh, for Yong Sheng, um, and Ethan's asked, "Will the BDK 2.0 be available in Node.js?" So thanks, Ethan, for the question. Uh, the way that we have uh, structured our prioritization process is just based on demand. So Java was first because most of our customers are primarily on Java and Python and .NET are just in descending order of demand. So unfortunately, Node.js doesn't have that level of demand that we see right now. It, I see it picking up, but you know, not in a production setting. There are pockets of customers using it, but unfortunately it's not quite there yet. So it's it will be there eventually, but after uh, Python and .NET come to general availability. So yeah, stay tuned and thanks for your question. Great, thanks Young Sheng. Um, Jose, a, a question for you anonymously. Um, this one seems quite technical to me, but um, how do you control database schema changes across the different database backends? Right, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so if you notice in, in, the, um, in, in my video that we've shown before, I define a very simple database schema with some fields and then a, a trade table. And this is what we call our GPAL dictionary files, so the Genesis platform abstraction layer dictionary files. Uh, and this is like an abstraction. It's a, it's a schema abstraction that is valid for every single database. And the way this works is we have a tool called Remap. So it can verify the current schema in our database layer against the changes in the dictionary files. And then it can apply the changes in the data model. So obviously the data model for Aerospike, it will be completely different than FoundationDB. These two databases have different APIs. They don't have relational database. Uh, they don't have any SQL APIs. So the, the APIs look completely different. Data model looks completely different, the schema list. But nonetheless, we have our translation layer. So every time you call Remap, it's able to understand this abstraction schema and do the appropriate changes in the relevant backend you're using. That's great, thank you. James, I, I can tell you're itching to ask a question or two. So um, I'll, I'll give you a, a chance to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before I actually ask my question, I was looking at um, Alex's um, question that he just put in the Q&A panel. Um, Alex, if you can just validate who your question is for, um, that'd be awesome. Um, but in the meantime, I'll ask my question if that's okay, Andrew. Um, so Yong Shang, this, is, this one's to you. So clearly through the demo that you gave of um, the Symphony BDK for Java, um, it actually accelerates uh, bot engineering. Can you tell us, you know, how much acceleration the project actually gives to anybody, you know, who wants to develop in that area compared to not using the BDK, for example? So if you, as we see a lot of customers uh, broadly divided into two camps. One of them, they've uh, 
traditionally use our OSDKs. So uh, that's the supported kind of uh, format. And the other uh, side of things, they chose to write it from scratch. So there's a risk that uh, things break because uh, as a SaaS provider, we roll out new features, new endpoints, and uh, things change on a pretty rapid basis, well, rapid for financial services. And we find that the, when you start to maintain these things on your own, uh, issues start to crop up really soon, especially when you put them in production and you don't have enough resources to maintain them. So the BDK 2.0 is really a way for us to simplify that approach by dividing uh, the modules down into different parts where we have the core structure that is much easier uh, to maintain and that part will not change often. And then we'll have different abstractions that you can then use to uh, accelerate different things like building uh, a command handler. So if you would do, do a command handler by scratch yourself uh, by hand today in the old SDKs, uh, it might take you an hour, maybe two. Uh, with the new uh, structure, it takes you five seconds. So there are different abstractions that we create because we know that there are more common uh, problems to solve. And so we deliberately built those into things that are just native and out of the box. So it enables you to really accelerate the initial part really, really quickly. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, which has come through for Jose. Um, Jose, the question's from Alex Lawrence. How do you model business validations across different entities in the system? That's a good question. It's <laughs> quite a long one to answer as well. I'll, I'll do my best. So, right, You've got business one minute. validations. <laughs> uh, business validations. Um, we do have different ways of handling validation. So starting from um, an entity perspective, and I know you ask about across different entities, but starting from an entity perspective, when you define your trade table, you can define certain attributes, like um, if, if some fields are nullable or not nullable, you define their field type, you define all these different things. And then you can automatically translate those into metadata resources that are exposed to the front end. So when the front end, let's say, needs to insert a new trade, it will know exactly all the types for each field, uh, all the non-nullable, nullable, all those things, if they're mandatory, they're optional, because perhaps you have some default values, um, everything is exposed to the front end and the front end can even automatically inflate the dialogue. So that's pretty, pretty nice to use. Now, if you want to use different entities, we have different approaches. One of them is to use an event handler, um, which will allow you to do validation across multiple entities. Um, or also the state machine, which is something uh, we want to talk more about very soon. Uh, we need to create some material and some videos for it, but basically it allows you to define um, states, state changes across entities uh, with certain validation, and this can be reused across the whole system. So it's, not, it's almost like a state model definition with, um, let's say, an order workflow, the or order lifecycle, new order, um, um, assign order, amend order, uh, cancel order, all these different things, all the different requirements to change the state from one to another, all those different things can be handled with a very nice to use uh, modeling tool we're, um, we're working on and we're always constantly improving. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, thanks for the, the question. That's a really good one. Thanks so much, Jose. I think we're, uh, we're now officially out of time. Um, look, once again, thanks to all the speakers. Thanks also to all the participants. Um, this uh, is, is all kind of meaningless without you. So we really appreciate you taking the time out to, uh, to come and learn about Finos, uh, about Symphony and about Genesis this afternoon. Um, look forward to seeing you at the next meetup and um, thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everybody. All the best. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.